Good morning to you all out there and welcome to the Key Points with me, Abna Tabi. We are live on TV3, also live on 3FM 93.7 and around the world at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. Today is the 10th day of August 2019 and we're here to look at major topics that made the headlines during the course of the week. And as usual, we'll encourage you to send through your comments and whatever it is you have to share with us on the topics that we'll be um, outlining soon to our WhatsApp line 020-216663. And we will read them out as we go along on the show. So today on the show, what are we looking at? We'll turn our attention, obviously, to um, the front banner conversation, which has to do with the Takra de Missing Girls. So while we await with bated breath the return of the three Takradi girls dominating the news this week has been reports of the retrieval of four sets of human remains from properties connected to one of the key suspects in the case. Indeed, news about the retrieval of the remains broke last Friday. Now, whereas the first three uh, sets of remains were retrieved from a septic tank on the premises of the residence of Samuel Odutuk Wales, the fourth is reported to have been retrieved from an uncompleted building from where the set suspect was rearrested when he escaped from cells in December last year. Now it's reported that the remains will be subjected to a forensic test to confirm whether they are those of the missing girls. Meanwhile, the families of the girls are calling for an independent forensic test. Some have suggested that this call by the families is an indication of the family's lack of confidence or distrust in the Ghana Police Service. Indeed, the performance of the Ghana Police Service in respect of this particular matter has been the subject of conversation for some time now, but has been brought under sharp focus or perhaps even more sharp focus this week in view of the new development. Indeed, many, many, many questions remain unanswered. Now, in a nutshell, the question on the minds of many Ghanaians is, would we consider the investigations conducted by the Ghana Police Service so far to be the best the service could offer us in the circumstances? Today on the show, we shall be um, looking at this development and matters arising. We'll also turn our attention to matters within uh, the space of the Ghana Manganese Company Limited. Now, much earlier in the week, the Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, uh, Mr. Kweku Asomachweme, announced government's directive to the Ghana Manganese Company Limited to stop all mining operations, exploration and export of minerals. Now, Mr. Asomachweme said the decision was taken after several infractions were found upon the completion of a preliminary technical and financial audit of the company's operations. Now, Although the company denies the minister's allegations, the minister has subsequently, by a press release uh, dated yesterday, 9th August 2019, stated that following a meeting with interested parties, the parties have agreed to expedite actions towards the resolution of the issues raised. Now, for this reason, the company has been directed to resume operations. Exactly what is happening with the Ghana um, Manganese Company Limited. This morning we shall interrogate all the matters that have come out from that quarters. And then we'll also turn our attention in a similar or in a related development to another state-owned enterprise which appears to be caught in a similar conundrum where workers of uh, PBC Limited in the week demonstrated on the premises of the company over what they describe as quote, incompetent management. So we shall be looking at the development at the PBC Limited this week as well and matters arising. These are the topics we have outlined for conversation this morning. As usual, the promises to be exciting, stimulating on the show. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, I'll introduce to you the first set of panelists for the discussion. See you shortly. Welcome back. So this is The Key Points. Uh, we are live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and around the world at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. I'll quickly introduce the panelists for uh, this part of the conversation. To my extreme left, we have Dr. Rich Mohinda 
He is the head of forensic science department at the University of Cape Coast UCC. Next to him is Professor Vladimir Indridanso, director of the academic affairs at the Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College. And to my right, we have Colonel Retired Festus Obwaji. He is a security analyst. We're expecting another uh, panelist to join us when he comes in. We'll do the needful and introduce him accordingly. But good morning, gentlemen. Welcome morning, to the show. Morning. It's good to have you. Um, <coughs> on Saturday last week, we started this conversation because just the night before, on Friday, um, a news broke about the police having retrieved um, some human remains um, from a septic tank located, you know, close to uh, the residence of one of the key suspects in the Takwa Day 3 missing girls um, case. Of course, uh, that conversation was sustained in the course of the week. Lots of developments have come up. We'll, 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 we will be looking at that into some details on the show. And to start us off, we'll take some sound bites from a press conference that was held, as well as we'll listen to um, the views from some of the families of the missing girls. So let's take a listen to these and then we come to the panelists in the studio. We the families would want to ask the police some questions and to spell out reasons why we don't want to avail ourselves for a DNA test. Our first question is, if the police claim they found human remains and that could possibly be the remains of our lovely girls, what becomes of the statement by the CID boss, the national security minister, and the interior minister that the girls are alive and safe? Are they trying to bring down the credibility of the above mentioned? Two, can the police tell us they made no search initially when Samuel Wills was arrested? Three, we will again want to ask, who would testify that the said remains were exhumed from the said septic tank since all civilians were driven away from the scene? Four, can the police come clear on why Mr. Peter Ofori Donko, the former DSP in Takrade, and Mr. Metepe, the CID, who handled the case initially were transferred since they know the depths of the issue. We are asking why the police keep distorting information concerning the whereabouts of our girls. We are that asking for an independent body to run a forensic test. The president came to the western region and you know Tap Riding was where the, the kidnapped occurred and you were thinking that uh, he would say something, even he would go and visit the families just to encourage them, just to inspire them. But the president came, he didn't, he didn't go to the families to see how they are faring. He just went to Axim, to go inside and act Axim and said, they are doing everything possible for the, 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 the girls to come back. In fact, when the families also heard it, they became very sad. You need to be brought to book. We want the police to arrest that national commander in the army to investigate the matter people, friends, relatives, and then even from the uh, security agencies, that all what has happened, which led to our refusal of the DNA test, they have taken it that in, in good faith, so we should comply so that the work can go on for the benefit of both the parents and the security agencies and the nation at large. So. I've given in that whenever they are ready and they come to me, I will be myself. Okay. Yes. Have you had any discussion with the other family members? Yes, I've had discussion with Mr. Bintum. But I asked of the uh, Cuisin's mother, but I was told he has traveled. So as for Mr. Cuisin, I had discussion with him. So um, w what I really, what did they say that make you convinced that indeed you want to submit yourself to a dna test it isn't from any, uh, one person even uh, uh, tv discussions and opinion leaders so many people have expressed their opinion that we should avail ourselves so that the work can go on even mr bright appear who is child right inter international activist he, he also spoke that do the all side with this that initially things didn't go on as well as we wished but we shouldn't dwell too much on that 
because doing so will also jeopardize the work of the police. So we should all give in and then help so that we can unravel the uh, mystery surrounding these boons once and for all. Uh, I know that your son uh, Michael addressed a press conference yesterday where he was categorical that um, they are not going to submit to a DNA nice test. Have you had any discussion with him, including Philip, and what are they saying? Oh, they all agree that we should uh, comply and then help the police. Okay. Uh, have you been told when this DNA test will be carried? Yes, that uh, I'm expecting. Uh, the arrival of the security agencies around two o'clock onwards so this was the information given to me yesterday so i'm expecting them okay yes. uh, uh, go ahead go ahead and when they come is this is what they have given me information that they are they will come but this morning no one has called me i had the information yesterday okay are you ready for the results of the test why not? I'm ready because what a led us entertain some doubt is that that they, they all the time we're seeing that uh, our daughters are alive and they know where they were. You see, that led us entertain the fears that maybe they want to give up okay. for the search. Welcome back. So um, you heard the press conference and also that uh, conversation with one of the f uh, members of the families of the missing girls there <coughs> with our Western Regional Correspondent there. Um, I'll start with you, Prof. Um, so you heard them. At the press conference, they raised um, certain key issues. In fact, they had earlier on said they were not going to you know, subject themselves to the DNA process but um, subsequently, we, we, we get from the clip in there as well <coughs> that they did, of course, upon, you know, Swish. exactly, and they, they did. But they, they are asking questions of the police. In fact, I, I mean, I see them as thought-provoking questions. Um, they say why, they keep, wh why the police keeps distorting, according to them, distorting information. They make reference to the statement by the CID boss and uh, to the effect that they know where the girls are and, all. and asking a very key question there that so if you know with this new development what are we to make of that statement and all I indeed to believe it. exactly <coughs> and all of that so tell tell me what is running through your, your your mind as you you know hear these things coming from uh, the families well, thank you very much i have been following uh, this incident uh, keenly uh, I don't miss a chance to yeah. read about it, listen to what is happening. And I'll be an issue, and on other media, I have said that the way we're handling the situation, especially from the media point of view, uh, is wrong. We seem to be stampeding the police as if as it were we know what they should do. And so they coming out, for example, to say, we, we know where the girls are, we'll find them. Uh, they may be right in thinking that the lead that they had was leading them to somewhere. Uh, elsewhere, it happens. But where subsequently they, you have the person who said we know where they are come to say that, well, that was said just to give them hope. I, I think, I think it is not, it's not a good thing. But normally, administratively, in the police policing, I'm not a policeman, mm. but those of us in the field, we know that these things, if you watch, uh, I've forgotten what medium, there's a program called Crime and Punishment in the U.S., mm. and I still watch it here. S with forensics, you're able to trace a crime that occurred some 30 years ago. It looks as though over here we don't understand the issues involved in, in tracking miscreants and bringing them to book. You may get a lead. You, you, the people are arrested, put to court, and all of a sudden you see that you are even very wrong in putting that person to court. We have had instances in our own country. And so my take on this is, is that it has not been properly handled. Mm. And again, we don't understand a lot of things. I mean, the president 
uh, should move from his itinerary and do the work of the police and things like that. It's yes, it's heartwarming if you have the president coming, but if it's not in, on his itinerary, we don't have to make any case out of that. The point is that something happened, something very, very, very bad happened. We're all looking for it. All we needed to do was to help the police, but rather we were stampeding the police, asking questions that will make them also falter one way or the other. But uh, sorry to cut you on the police. Yes. Um, there, I mean, clearly some have suggested that perhaps they set themselves up for this kind of reaction that they are getting from the public in the sense that, I mean, if, if, you, if you study the course of this case, right. there's right. been several <coughs> instances where, <coughs> you know, that the performance of the police have had to be called into question. That's right. There's been a cell break yes. and it's been alleged right. that some members of the service, service. actually help this person, right. um, you know, right. escape from cells. Right. So when you have these kinds of things in the mix, wouldn't you say that, well, there's perhaps some basis for the kind of reaction we are getting from the I public? I haven't doubted that there is better let even basis. Add, let me add yeah. to that. Just um, on Friday last week when they went to, you know, retrieve these bodies, we yes. are told. I mean, there was an eyewitness. We did. I mean, our correspondent right. spoke to that eyewitness right. and said, she says that when the police came there, yeah. they were asking residents for tools to go and dig, you know, the, the, the septic tank for these. And so the question then is how prepared were the police when they went there? So I'm saying against this background, would you say the, pub, the, the media and the public is stampeding the, the, the police? Still, I would stay on that, that we were stampeding them. Yes, the police falter as a human institution. They will have a whole, and especially within our back, backyard over here, where recruitment, training, whatever it is, you know. So we can follow them as an institution. They reached there, they wanted tools. We need to help them if we have the tools. So they I don't mean, have tools? They were going, and they, they may not know that we are going to get the spot. What I'm saying is that no matter what the fault is, we should help the police to give them the tools. Elsewhere, when a police stops you, and they've done that to me once in Ghana in the 80s, they stopped me, they were chasing somebody, and I had to give my car. I doubt if the Ghana would understand such a situation. I, 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 so I, let, I, let, let me just let me more. You know, Still <laughs> on that bit, I found it intriguing because yeah. the report, as I read it, said that these men, the police personnel who went there to yeah. do the retrievals, That's were right. actually sent from Accra. That's right. On a tip of or, or on the information that yeah, this right. is what they were going right. to do. So from the word go, they said of knowing what they were going no, to this do. No, this is where we are at times wrong. Okay. This is where we are at times wrong. A tip off. They need to be there quickly to see whether they can locate. As they located, probably, and I'm not saying I'm speaking for the police, probably they saw that there is a need to assume right now. So if the advance party didn't have the tools and said, please, public, help us to retrieve these bodies, and they called in, I'm told, the fire service later. And the prison, you know, prison service. Prison and the prison service. service. You know, so that's how the police should work. On the spur of the moment, you must use all the tools in the tools box to act. I, I, I'm saying this because of what I know, how police work elsewhere. But it's like every other act, every other step we want to interrogate mm -hmm. and, and find out why they shouldn't do it this way or that. That is where I'm saying we're stampeding them. Maybe the understanding didn't come. And again, as I said, it is the media. The media sets the agenda. You understand? The information, the education, the entertainment aspect. I won't talk about it. Mm -hmm. But if you are setting the agenda, you set it in such a way that we help to resolve mm -hmm. rather than helping to, you know, the stalemate and whatnot. And the feelings that the family had, the wooden sabita, it's a human feeling. The police have psychologists within their midst where they could use them to, you know, do all the kinds of things that we're talking about. Talk to them. It's a normal thing. I will subject myself to whatever it is. They say they, they are right. You know, but then we need this forensic to sh sh uh, ensure that they are the, the, the girls anyway. Mm -hmm. I think the police are thinking they are. I, I, I'm not saying they've said that. Because of the, the, the perpetrator. That's the where he lived. Mm -hmm. They forced him and they say uh, he led them there. And so that is why there is a, it may come out. That after all, these are not the girls. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a story. I was in Boston. A father, a, a son had killed somebody and uh, what not. All the, and they were not living together. I mean, uh, broken home. Uh, finally, when the DNA was taken, uh, there is a claim that uh, he's not the father. <laughs> can, can you imagine? They've, they've lived all this long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and, and who knows? 
that something can come out of this forensic for us to know that they are after all not the girls mm -hmm. or after all there is some so all these things are steps towards resolution and police that's how they work mm. they also falter in our part of the world they falter even too much mm. and all we which need is to why, do is yes, to which them. is why you know the public will be on their case because and, and let me come to you dr Farqua. this i mean the first incident or the first reported case of the kidnappings among the the, the three now it's actually four, four. Yeah. we heard yes. yeah I mean, it was back in, was it August? Yeah, last year. Last year. So it's a year. Mm -hmm. July. <coughs> July, thank you. So it's, it's past a year now. And people are asking questions. For instance, the retrieval of the remains from, you know, and uh, coincidentally, these two sites where they retrieved the remains from are connected to the key suspect, mm -hmm. Samuel Odutuk. One, where he, his residence, and the other, where the fourth, re where he was rearrested. I mean, it, it can't be coincidence i mean yeah. of course i don't want to speculate but it just mm -hmm. can't be co coincidence so the question then is why did it have to take a year well i'm i'm spe i'm asking the questions on the minds of the public mm -hmm. why did it have to take the police a year to do that well because some are saying that you know with these things when it comes to searches you would want to you know consider a whole lot of things and so why is it that it had to take a year for the residents of the key suspect to be searched in this manner. Yeah, you see, this, this whole process is, is bringing to the fore the, the eminent lacks and lapses we have when it comes to recruitment into the police service. I, I have always maintained that uh, the kind of people we recruit and the processes they go through, that the recruitment process, is is extremely inadequate we have a situation where in a country you will recruit somebody into the police service who has no idea what criminal investigation is who has n who has learned absolutely nothing about security uh, community policing whatever and these group of people are given some three months six months training and put on the job as police officers and there is no form of retraining whatsoever somebody is recruited into the service and for over 30 40 years has not received any form of retraining whatsoever you you don't expect such a person to perform magic ordinarily and so when they're not performing the magic we will talk about it exactly <laughs> that is when we need to interrogate the very course of the problems we are facing this very moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, this kidnapping issues, after, after this whole process or the investigation goes through, we need to interrogate it step by step and learn lots of lessons from this whole thing. You see, apart from the recruitment uh, challenges that the police uh, has, tooling of the police. You, you have questioned why they had to uh, get tools from the public to assess the crime scene. The, you are asking, they came from Accra all the way to Takradi and they couldn't organize the tools. Do they have the tools to conduct such uh, investigations at the crime scene? You understand? Do they even understand the nitty gritties of crime scene management? These are all questions we need to ask and uh, at the end of the day, try help the police to solve these lacks. So going forward, why it took a year? You see, this case is a kidnapping issue. The, the kidnappers and uh, a parent or some of the parents had communicated and the police got wind of the communication. I think the parents even talked to some of the girls at a point showing clearly that the girls were alive at the time mm -hmm. the police stepped in and within a day or two the police made an arrest you see all this while we are not talking about those things some of the successes chalked in this issue the police made <coughs> a very early arrest albeit uh, after a while the guy broke jail and uh, all that when the police went to the scene initially they weren't hoping to be finding dead bodies they were hoping 
to find evidence at the scene that will link them to where the kidnappers or abductors, whatever, have taken the girls. So they were looking for you live mean, just bodies. Just this recent operation? No, oh, okay. initially. Right, cool. They were looking for live bodies. Mm -hmm. You understand? So they won't go. I've, I've, I've been asked this question. Why they didn't search the suspect the very first day they went to the scene? After you have had uh, news that the kidnappers had talked to the parents, that the, some of the parents had even talked to the girls, and you go there, you are looking for belongings of the girls, possibly. You are, you are looking for who lives in that in area. In some instances, they did pick up certain scarves. Exactly. And, you know. Exactly. And all of these helped them to make that early arrest. You see, that was a huge success. Coming down that line, after a year or over a year, this is where we have arrived at, that uh, some bones have been picked, suspect, suspected to be mortal remains of the girls. And all of a sudden, we are asking questions as if the girls have been confirmed dead. They have not been confirmed as But we as don't we have speak. to wait for that confirmation to ask these very pertinent questions. No, we, we, we asking, do. Right? We do have to wait. Mm -hmm. We, we have do, to. Yes, we do have to wait for that confirmation to come. Things are ongoing. Exactly. And they've arrested another person. I think he's being brought from Nigeria. Nigeria, yeah. You know, all these are leads. And just to buttress what you sure. were saying, uh, why a year? And the uh, miscreant could mislead you to a rigmarole. And as I said, I watched a film, uh, 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 this thing, reenacted, whatever it is, mm -hmm. for 38 years. And they were able to arrest sure, the I mean, yes, I mean, so, so these things, they're waiting, you know, yes, they're waiting. Unresolved for a long time. For a long if, time. If, if that, so yes. this one year, for if me, we underestimate the, the psychology of these miscreants, we stand at risk of running this case down. Exactly. Or any yeah. other case. Any other case, yeah. for that matter. Because, uh, you see, and initially you asked why the police were telling us that they knew the whereabouts of the girls and that they were alive and safe. These miscreants, after you arrest them, will give you very solid leads. Leads that you think are extremely solid. The reason is that you go hit a wall, come back. You see, after a while, the whole case grows cold. You don't have any evidence to prosecute them. And then you, they, you, you have to shift into the gear of letting them go. Because they have assisted you in every possible way to find the girls, and you have not found them. And yet, you don't have any evidence to, to keep up the case. And you won't have any form of justification holding them. And you have the human rights organization coming mm. on your neck. Exactly. Mm. And you the see, lawyers come. So, so this, this whole thing, we have to approach it with some tact. And I, 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 I want to side with Prof on, on where the media handling of the case has not been the best really i think we have we have forced the police to take some knee-jerk reactions mm -hmm. and it, it hasn't really helped what, all of what us what kind of knee-jerk reactions have they taken as a result of the media reportage for instance i mean some some of the things the police do now they do with some sort of carefulness you understand right now the last time i was being asked why the cid has still not come up with a presser or something informing the police or informing the public about how far mm -hmm. they have gone after the, the, the mortal remains were found. That, that may be in order, but if, if I were in the CID, I'll be careful because now there is no concrete information to give. There are snippets of it we can give. Some of them may lead nowhere. But that, but, but that would be a professional decision, not because you've been, you know, forced into not speaking well, well you see sometimes we want to we want to be careful and protect our jobs we want to be careful and protect our jobs so that is where we have to the reportage will have mm -hmm. to be uh circumspect a circumspect no, no, my, worry, my sure. worry in that specifically you know, is the you see you lead the national psyche a, against an institution yeah as if they are lethargic one, as if they are incompetent, and that national psyche fits into but, but, reactions. I, I will move to um, uh, Keno here, but quickly on that, yeah. I think, it, you know, laying that at the doorstep of the media to an extent would be unfair because some of these are coming from the family. 
or the families. They themselves are saying that I said they shouldn't cover. No, they cover in the family. The family is somehow. Because Worried, the and families they stated consistently now. have raised issues about how the police have Unders handled these. And, and you, you should understand ways. them mm -hmm. because exactly. the, the psyche of the family now, you, you can't fault them when they are raising lots of because exactly. they need answers. And they are raising issues about, they, I'm quoting, you know, that the gentleman who spoke at the press conference, he, yeah. he said the police have been distorting information. There's no two ways about that. They are saying that, but, but let, but, me, let um, me. A quick let, one. Yes. When you, are, yesterday I was listening to one, uh, this, I think it was Accra FM, and I was angry because you are adding some nuances that will bring a national mm. psyche against the police. For example, they were saying that even the, where the bodies were exhumed is uh, uh, Charles McCarthy's period when the slaves were running away. That's where they oh, shot yeah. them. I, I do appreciate I, that, I, of course. I, I do appreciate that. I mean, we do need to be circumspect, yes. yes. But also, we have a responsibility to raise certain pertinent questions when they come up in respect of the police. Now, Kenel, yes, please. tell us what you make of this and the concern for many is that it's gradually looking like you know mm. the incidence of kidnappings or cases of kidnappings you know is, is going high and so if we have a situation where it appears that the police is struggling to deal with this how are we to feel as citizens and this isn't to create panic it's just a legitimate question i believe that we need to you know look into thank you very much um, let me respect the the views uh, expressed by the two profs <laughs> and the expert, forensic expert. Right. But um, whilst I agree with some of the points they've made, I, I also disagree mm. uh, with some other points. Now, I vehemently disagree that the media has, has not helped matters. Thank in you. fact, if I can <laughs> cite, <laughs> I'm that. Yeah. if I can <laughs> cite one instance in which the media has not helped the investigations, it's got to do with the Daily Guide, which substantively said a few weeks ago that the girls had been driven, flown, brought from Takradi. They were at a medical facility in Accra. Now, that is a very major issue which goes to the core of the investigations. Yeah. Now, on the basis of how some allegations, um, news, uh, audio file allegations, have been made against certain eminent persons, I was expecting that the news editor of Daily Guide should have been invited by the national security agencies to explain the circumstances under which the girls or whoever were brought from Takradi to Accra. So that's one instance. Now, the media platform is like what we call in the army the jungle. The jungle is absolutely neutral. You can use it as a friend or your enemy can use it as its friend. So the media platform is there. They grant the platform, for instance, now for us to express opinions. We cannot hold TV3 to account that they are influencing you know, the investigation. Right. But let me, let me leave, leave it there. Now, the police should set the professional agenda and not allow the media to hijack the course and the direction of the investigation. And they failed. In fact, they have failed at different junctures to, to do that. Right. First of all, in terms of uh, relations with the family, they had told us that they were liaising, they were in contact with the family. It turned out to be false. Mm. Even when the liaison officers were introduced to the families, the families came back and said, we still haven't seen them. They don't visit us. So that's one. Now, to allow a prisoner or a detainee to escape from the detention facility is a very serious offense. Mm -hmm. Till today. The police has not told us how they have dealt with those um, individuals who might be involved. Because yeah. this gentleman, what's his name? Samuel, Samuel Wells, told us that there was an accomplice mm -hmm. from the police or from, from that uh, yeah. office. That's one side. Now, all the indications that we're discussing now, that this thing didn't happen at uh, Tuyabodong. It happened right at the regional capital. 
where you expect that even if the police didn't have capacity and expertise at the regional headquarters, they should have some semblance of a detective team. If we're being told that at Takradi, a regional capital, and Takradi, or Western region for that mean? matter, the new yeah. Western yeah. region, again, is not like other regions. It's been there, you know, uh, for, for a very long time as a metropolis. The police has not been able to deploy the expertise, the skills, and to the extent that they even had to go and look for machetes or cutlasses and pickaxes. It tells you that beyond capacity, planning was yeah. also insufficient. Because yeah. if you could arrange for the prison service to bring you Some a septic teacher. tank, whatever Empty, it is, they say. Yeah. why couldn't you sit around the table and say, when we get to the house, what it, is it that we're going to need? Again, we can talk in theoretical terms. I stand to be corrected, but I think the police has told us that there was a certain gentleman, a police officer, who investigated a similar case about eight years ago. And therefore, he had a hunch. He said, that why don't we go and look at the septic tank? On Facebook, a colleague of mine, I wouldn't mention his name on this block, asked, so after one year, or during the course of the one year, we had not thoroughly searched the premises. Now, when they went to the premises, there were a number of methods that they could have used. First of all, the human eyes, the photographs, you know, to try and go back to the office and piece the pictures together and get a sense of the state of the premises. Video. Again, looking for blood spots or blood spot or whatever it is. Going with the chemicals or calling for those chemicals, forensics, to come spray the walls and so on to find whether you could find traces of all of this didn't happen which raises the, the question dogs. do they even have are they equipped the dogs are they even equipped the dogs are there because after one year they deploy the dogs mm. so i'm saying that i'm speaking from my background as a military officer right when you're planning any operation whether it's defense whether it is uh, offense whether it is whatever it is there are a number of factors that you take into consideration. So even if your lead team went there unprepared, you call for backups. And the backups will come with additional skills and expertise to deploy. Now, to excuse the police that in the course of one year, before it occurred to them that they should go and look at the septic tanks, I mean, it raises a whole lot of questions. But be it as it is now, or it may, Let's wait, as uh, our colleagues have said, for the forensics. And I have a whole lot of issues with the forensics. Okay. Now, it's a question of trust. You see, the police have compromised the trust that the public and the That's family the should repose in That's them. That's the point. And I still stand by my original idea that even after the forensics have been done, regarding the DNA extraction or whatever it is, when the bodies, and the bodies must be released, assuming that the police results say that they are the bodies of the girls, uh -huh. they must be released to the family. The family must ask for an independent investigation, forensic investigation, because that we cannot trust the police. You see, wow. and I've not even mentioned the politicians mm. uh, who have also compromised themselves mm. by saying things that were beyond their remit as politicians and trying to interfere with the work of the police. Mm. So, indeed, if the media has interfered with the work of the police, we must hold some of the politicians to account, who also told us that they had found the girls, either on a tablet, and that the girls mm -hmm. look good, mm. or they had found them somewhere in Nigeria, mm. plus daily guide that I will not mm. I'll continue to mention, right. which said that the girls were in Accra. So, let's wait for the results to either prove or disprove mm -hmm. So that the police will, will know the new direction in which the investigation should mm. go. Very well. I will come back to you in respect of, you know, you mentioned it briefly, the fact that, yes, Takradi itself, you know, is, mm. uh, is no mean mm. city. Yes. And the fact that it, the, the police has, you know, regional commands. And so if Takradi is unable to do, definitely it falls on other We've seen that play out here when, where the Accra, the personnel from Accra had to go there. We'll be interrogating why that had to happen. Is it that there's the capacity at Takrade is an issue 
or what. But in the meantime, let's speak to um, Mr. Bright up here. He is on the line. Mr. Bright up here is the executive director of the Child Rights International. Um, good morning, Mr. Pia. Uh, good morning. How are you? And thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you too. Great. So you have been, you know, closely in touch with the families. Indeed, in the clip that we played earlier, we had uh, one of the family members indicate that you had actually, or you were one of those who persuaded them to, you know, cooperate with the police in respect of the DNA testing. Tell us, um, what exactly has transpired to date? And, you know, if you have any indication of what is happening, you know, going to happen anytime soon in respect of this. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think what the, the, the matter came up in terms of the operation that the police uh, carried out, uh, that evening I called the family and I realized that they were not in the know, but the news has been already published by uh, some uh, media stations. Mm. So it was a bit difficult for me to uh, pick it up. So, I so you see that the family that. had not been informed about the... The, what the police had retrieved from the suspect's uh, house. That's what you're saying? Exactly. exactly. Okay. At the time that they published it, the family, the, the family were not aware mm. of it. So even calling them, I felt very bad because I thought they had it. So I was trying to massage it so that we have mm. a focus on it. So I told them that, look, uh, any news that they hear, if it is not officially coming from the police, they should not, they should not accept it and they should not uh, treat it with any seriousness. Right. So we managed it at that level until uh, the police met them on Saturday and broke the news to them. And they also used the opportunity to beg them for things that has happened in the past. So we all agreed that, look, this is an opportunity for us to also bring a closure to this particular issue in terms of the options that were made available. And this is one of the things that we can use to bring a closure to it. So we should compromise and also uh, support cooperate with the police. To, to do the uh, the DNA test and all that. So they gave me the assurance. So at the point, I realized that they were so furious in terms of the way and manner they've been treated throughout the process. And I must say that uh, visiting the family and having a discussion with them, I don't think that our security system gave them the best of treatment. Mm. It's the treatment that they gave the family wasn't uh, good at all. I think that they should have done better. But that is the case. So they took a position. So I have to go back to them and inform them that, look, where we are now, uh, we need to do something. And for us, uh, co uh, cooperating with the police can give us two options as, as, as a family. That one, if they do the test and, and the families are not satisfied with it, they still have the opportunity to engage an independent person mm. uh, to do it for them and for confirmation or reject the position of the police. And if they do it and it's not the, uh, it's not something that relates to the family or not another girls, then it helps us, it gives us another opportunity to put pressure on the police to deepen the search and then also closing that kind of option that they've given to us now. So we've been back and forth with it and, 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 the whole, and uh, they've, they've accepted the position that they want to cope with the police. But I also think that the police henceforth should try to engage a certain strategy, a strategy you know, in engaging the family. If you listen to uh, what one of the panel was talking about, uh, the, the, the ex-military officer, these yeah. are a lot of things that they could have used in, 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 in engaging the families and also making sure that they get information. Because the kind of information that came out during the, the, the one year, you cannot link them up to the operation that they've done. They are not connected. You know, so uh, clearly something went wrong. And, and that acceptance must be there so that we'll see how best we can carry out with uh, the things that we are doing now and then how the outcome will be in respect to the, uh, the, the remains that they found. Very well. Um, clearly, quickly before you go, the, 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 the trust the family has for the police is immense. Um, are you in any way, you know, or any other group trying to, you know, ensure that there is some level of, you know, even beyond this, subjecting themselves to the C DNA process, you know, to get them to cooperate more with the police? Oh, yes. You see, the, the kidnapping is a very... Uh, it's not only uh, a criminal issue. I always establish that, that, look, kidnapping is not only criminal. There's a, a social component of it that we have to deal with because it, it involves people, it involves families. 
and you have to also condition the minds of the family to understand or appreciate the value of information that we give to them. And at that level, to us, the state, we failed in doing that. We have never assigned any clinical psychologist to work on the minds of the family. We have not assigned anybody to also look at their welfare and all that to give them relevant information that they would accept. So at this level, uh, the families can only do this. And in fact, the families are doing this because people have spoken to them that, look, they have to cooperate. Mm -hmm. If left to the family alone and how they've been treated in the past, they wouldn't have accepted it. So the police, if the police want them to accept the information that are relevant in respect to this case, then they must, they must have a way of developing a relationship mm -hmm. with the family in such a way that whatever they put out there will be relevant right. or the, the, the family will accept it. But as, as we speak now, uh, the family still don't believe that whatever the police are doing uh, is, a, is the right thing that they are doing. So they should, they should devise a certain strategy in engaging the family so that they will develop that relationship. But I believe that when that relationship is established, then whatever it is that the outcome may be, uh, I'm sure the family would, would uh, accept it. Very well. Um, we'll end it here. Thank you so much, Mr. Bright Appiah. He is the Executive Director of Child Rights International. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll look into other aspects of this very, very important but disturbing development. And we will see you shortly. Welcome back. You're still watching and listening to The Key Points. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and around the world at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we're still looking at uh, recent developments concerning the three Takra de Missing Girls. In fact, let me say four because this week we are told of um, a fourth um, girl that went missing and uh, there's also coincidentally um, a finding of the fourth set of human remains. Um, we're still looking at that. And let me come to you, Dr. Um, Afoka. You are a forensics expert here. Now, we are told that the police would, um, it would take a period of about four weeks for them to get the test done and uh, um, ultimately uh, the report, you know, made public, hopefully. Um, tell us, you know, briefly what the process, you know, is from the point of collection of the human remains yeah. to what happens and how easy is it to establish any real conclusions given the time? time yeah, first, first and foremost, I, I don't know where that four week uh, timeline mm -hmm. came from. I'm not sure it came from the police because uh, I'm not sure any police uh, officer would stick his or her neck out and say that in four weeks you are going to get results. But you've heard that. that I have is heard it. Right. I have heard it. I'm not, this is not the first time mm -hmm. I'm talking about this four week uh, period mm -hmm. thing. But from the point of collecting the bones, you would need to sort the bones out. You know, they were, they were collected, all of them together, the scalps together, the humerals, the ribs, the vertebrae, everything was together you would need to sort them out because these are three sets. You, you cannot put the skull of one remain on the neck of the other. So you have to go through uh, a very Methodolo methodological, methodological process. process of uh, separating and uh, assorting the bones to the right uh, bodies. After that, you will have to do some physical examinations on the bones. I mean, some forensic <coughs> examination on the bones to ascertain whether indeed there are bones of girls, bones of uh, that's males or females. You will have to do some sort of analysis also to uh, guess the age at which the, the person died. You would also, there may be, the bones can be telling you a story for example, if there is a fractured skull or a fractured humerus, it may be telling you a story as to how the person died. And that, that can take quite some time. After that, then you come to the point where we are all talking about, about a DNA analysis. And a DNA analysis, routinely, every lab will do some paternity testing. Every, every lab may do some genotyping of some sort. And the kind of reagents you use for that is totally different from the kind of reagents <coughs> you will use in isolating or extracting DNA from bones. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So I have I have been saying and making this point that the Ghana Police Forensic Lab did not have any reagent for extraction of DNA from bones sitting on the shelf. And it will take time for them to order and receive these reagents. Not too much time, though. Mm. This is, I'm talking about a four-week uh, thing. So, if I were in charge of this, I wouldn't give a four-week timeline. timeline. Mm -hmm. You understand? Because the whole, and imagine the case where the families were not willing to cooperate. It would, it would even extend the period further. So, I think it's about time we all call off this four-week timeline. But is it, is it, you're talking about the, how well equipped or otherwise of the forensic labs we have, you know, the Ghana Police Service, have, and you're saying that that reagent that is needed is not? No, no. It's not, it's not as if it's a lack. But no manager will buy a reagent okay. you don't to hope store. to use and store. Right. That is absolutely bad management. So it's standard practice. It's standard practice. That you what order you, it what you you what you do routinely mm -hmm. is what you order. For example, paternity testing is done routinely. So if, for example, we went to the lab for a paternity test and they told us that they didn't have reagents, that is a lack. Mm. You understand? But for this, I think this will this I don't know uh, the records of the lab, but this may be the first time they are actually extracting bone, uh, DNA from bones. <coughs> So you don't expect them to have it, you understand? Mm. Even though the reagents are out there on the market mm. that you can easily buy. So this timeline, this four-week timeline, we have to shelve as soon as possible before it creates another problem for us because people have already started counting down. Especially if it's coming from the police. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if it is coming from the police, thank you. People have already started <coughs> counting down and waiting. Mm. It may so happen that uh, after about two weeks or three weeks, the results will be ready. Mm. It may happen that it's, it may go further than that because once you extract the DNA, even the DNA extraction process will have to be optimized some way, somehow. The polymerase chain reactions will have to be optimized some way, somehow, and it takes quite some time. Mm -hmm. So I will call for some more time. Mm. Assuming the four-week uh, timeline elapses and the police doesn't have result we shouldn't put too much pressure on them because this whole process may take time right yeah. great uh, prof you have spoken i mean earlier on in your submissions um looked at perhaps after all is said and done we need to look at how we get the situation we have with the police you know ultimately fixed yes um so in other words, you're looking at reforms, transformations, and sure. all. And we do know sure. that the immediate past um, IGP launched a transformation now. Right. Is it a transformation right. agenda mm -hmm. yes. for the police service? I, I don't know how far that went during his tenure. Sure. But we would obviously hope that that kind of transformation agenda is continued even beyond his tenure. Sure. Uh, and yes, so how, how do you see that? Do you think there's that commitment to actually fixing the situation because we're talking about a police service that well they don't often say it but we do know behind the scenes they talk and they do admit to inadequacies in the system so if we are serious about policing in ghana keeping the citizens safe we ought to be writing a different narrative than what we have now don't you think so and I agree do you with think you that will is there to actually fix the problem i agree with you 100 percent but the main point is, is that we should understand that as our society grows more sophisticated under globalization, we need also to be more sophisticated in our institutional setup mm -hmm. and operational setup of our institutions. And the police is one of them because when you talk about the civil side, you know, our society is becoming more um, undisciplined, our society is becoming more sophisticated in terms of crime, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And so the police service itself has been transforming gradually. Every um, IGP I've known has had a way of trying to, to uh, reform. reform and make the reforms commensurate with the, the times. So if but you would you say these, all these attempts to reform go to the root of the problem? Because Absolutely we, not. I was right. coming to that. Mm -hmm. That unfortunately, whether it is resource constrained, 
whether whatever it is because right now we told we need not less than about 50,000 police uh, during President Kufo's time we were all talking about uh, the fact that we need an expansion and some of us were talking about using more uh, artificial intelligence and things like that so the more sophisticated our society is going the more we need to reform our uh, police service true to them let's let's be honest with them too they have a lot of good professionals but you can be as good as a good professor anyway if you don't have the structures as a university. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you know. So the the past immediate uh, um, IGP himself, he's a huge professional who was used by the UN and other places. He's a forensic expert also, and he's a, uh, I mean, it's huge where the profession is concerned. Uh, take other IGPs that I have known, Alassane himself. You know, so it depends on the structures that need to be put in place for which society. Unfortunately, as we all know, uh, we have lamented that what kind of people are put in the police and what type of training, like my brother was saying, what type of training. There are areas we saw that the, the Ashama case, which, which happened some time ago, five, six, seven years ago or so, we were told that the assistant superintendent of police after his training that was the first time he was confronted with rioting mm -hmm. of that magnitude and in panic all he did was to ask the arsenals to be also emptied he just distributed mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know so you're right what we need actually is a kind of police service that is commensurate with the current structure and psyche of our society mm -hmm. if we don't do that and unfortunately the politicians come and at times they do not even understand the institutional frameworks that need to be put in place. They, and, and they interfere right from the village level to the IGP level. You see the politicians interfering. This case we're talking about, I don't know, but there could be a possibility that a regional minister can come there and also be talking when he doesn't know how the police are working. They talk. They, they talk. talk. They talk. You know, <laughs> that, that, these are the things we're having. But if we have, I've always mentioned the problem of institutionalism in Ghana. If you resource the institution very well, you keep off the institution, they will do their work according to the remit given them by the constitution. And then we can force them as when they are not doing this or doing that. Mm. My take on this when I'm blaming the media is also that we, we have not understood the police and the lacks and the knots. And therefore, when we have a national psyche guiding them to tell us what we want to hear, it is a sebaster situation. Right now, the focus is on the police. The focus has shifted from the cri the problem that we want to solve, and eventually we may leave the problem unsolved. There are several problems. The is it the uh, Brown Hafu, where the six young men were killed? Uh, what do you call it? Uh, Ashanti region. region. Uh -huh. uh, I, I think the media is not quiet on that. Mm. <laughs> there are several other issues where we need to know the systematic way in which these things are done. Areas uh, in the world where the police are so how do I call it? Sophisticated. And strong. 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 You yeah. see a crime and within within seconds, like the London bombing, whatever it is, within seconds, the culprit is, 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 is apprehended. You have forensic artists who, with just, just a description of, so it draws the, the person and within seconds the person is apprehended. We are getting there where our society needs such Prof, persons. Prof, we, are, we, we will get there. <laughs> I, have, I have made this comment that the economy of Ghana is growing. Yes. As the economy grows, we should expect more criminal exactly. activities. In fact, crime is concomitant with economic Society. growth. Uh, the, the, the bigger economies have so much more crime, criminal activities occurring there than we do. Of course. So as we are growing, we should expect the number of criminal activities to increase. And it is a fact, isn't it, also, exactly. that the criminals are always ahead of the state. Exactly. But at least let so us that, that is meet what, the minimum that is expectations. What, that is know. what should tell us that it is about time we resource the police more than we do. It is about time we look at what exactly they need to conduct or to perform the works they do. Uh, it is good to buy cars for the police, but yeah. if the policeman drives the car from Accra to talk a day and he doesn't have a camera to capture the crime scene what has he done if he doesn't have the the tools to cordon off the scene 
What have you done? Or if the driver of the car is just a political driver. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> so there are more problems. Mm. And that, that, that's, that is what I say that. After this whole case goes through, we, we need, need to, to interrogate yeah. step right. by step and see the right. lessons we learn from sure. here. Now, kind of still on how you know the police is resourced and all, I earlier on raised the issue about the regional command in Takade and then you know having to fall on really and truly I, I think that's how we can describe it because if the personnel had to move from Accra to Takade to do that what does that say in terms of of course we've talked about the lack of resources but I'm looking at is it a situation that you think maybe it's it's some implied admission of the fact that maybe how it's been handled in Takradi or the people around the situation in Takradi have left, you know, a certain impression on the public and particularly maybe the families that, well, in going about this, let's have, you know, people come. Because the reason why I'm saying that is if Accra had gone to Takradi fully equipped, then the issue about resources wouldn't be up. But it seems Accra went to Takradi unprepared. So it's a case of moving... <laughs> from Accra to Takra, they, not to help in any situation regarding the mm. resourcefulness of the mm. police. Because, um, so it must, in my opinion, it must be something else other than resources. Bringing a, well, bli uh, bringing a blind man to lead the blind. Well. <laughs> it's Accra going to Takra is not <coughs> necessarily it's a not sign bad. of, um, how should I say it? A, a sign of inefficiency or whatever. It's probably the case that Accra deployed more or higher expertise, you know, technical detective expertise, more numbers to go and reinforce mm. or back up the expertise at Takwadi. And I would say once again that if Takwadi didn't have some <coughs> level of, uh, for uh, not forensic, detective you know, expertise, mm -hmm. then I think that's a, a big uh, lapse. Mm. But we're talking about leadership. Right. All of the discussions that we've been having here and elsewhere is about leadership. So to reinforce what uh, my two colleagues have said, I would encourage the, the new IGP, who is a friend of mine because I've known him going back to about 2007 or 10, thereabout to try and, you know, let his leadership, you know, um, permeate down. Mm. down to the lowest uh, level. Again, I think we should be talking about, police work is about public relations. So how the police endear themselves to the society, to the local community, you know, is very, very important. Uh, we having some of the discussions that we having because the police have not worked very hard to endear themselves to to the uh, local population. But again, I've said elsewhere that public information is completely different from psyops. Mm -hmm. Some of the statements that have muddled the can the, the, can the psyops is. You and me, what, what are science? <laughs> it's <laughs> it's where you try to influence the thinking, right. you know, the, the thinking, the psyche, mm. the emotions. Psy psychological so you emotion. want to give hope, yes. for instance. Yes. It's psyops. It's not public yes. information. Mm -hmm. Public information is making the facts available mm -hmm. on established public platforms. Part of the problem we're having also is that the police is making a very delicate balancing act mm -hmm. between putting information out and not putting information mm -hmm. out. Yeah. In the absence of well, sufficient line, information, uh, line. <laughs> <laughs> people are, are, are forced to make assumptions mm -hmm. and advance the arguments. Right. Mm -hmm. You see, so I would, I would encourage the police to the extent possible to tell the public what it is that they know. To the extent that what they tell us does not prejudice mm -hmm. the, the investigations. Again, you've alluded to that. Uh, that's uh, the, the technician yeah. or the expert from Cape Coast. And I think right. Dr. Nchidansu too has done it. Look, this protocol in quotes thing is doing a great damage to national security. Mm -hmm. You see, you can 
take protocol and put them in the police, put them in the Ghana Armed Forces, put them everywhere, to the extent that even when recruits are discharged from training institutions, telephone calls have been made for the institutions to take them back. Now, police work, military work, is about aptitude. Mm -hmm. So it's not everybody who has got the aptitude to be a nurse. Yeah. Go, you're scared of blood. You know, and therefore, it's not everybody who has got the aptitude to do police work. But when these people have been dumped into the police service, and they just remain there with or without sufficient in-service training, mm -hmm. and just rise with heavy shoulders to hold leadership appointments, that is what we are seeing now. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that police officers, senior police officers, are not professional. But we all know, anecdotally, empirically, that some of the appointments are politically yeah. sure. you know, uh, based yeah. and it's not helping us. Mm. Police uh, positions must be filled by people who are qualified, who have the expertise, who have got the skills, who have got the moral courage to talk truth to power, yeah. you know, in order to uphold the national security. Right. That's all. Right. Not to please any politician or any political party for that matter. Right. And the resourcefulness of the police, critical issue. And the police, as Kofi Bentil said, must ask for the right things. For instance, let's talk about um, so many vehicles having been given to the police. As elsewhere, when the 300 or so vehicles were given to the police, was the police given the budget for the maintenance and for the fuel. Yeah. And, and, and even the kind of cars yeah. that we, 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 we were given to them. see a lot of them parked. They're looking, exactly, because these are, well. Let me take some messages that have come through. Um, this one is coming in from Fiam in Abo. He says, why is the CID boss still at post after deceiving Ghanaians that they knew where the kidnapped girls were? The CID boss should be sacked now. Now, please, I'll be coming to you for your opinion on that. So please prep your minds on that. And it says, good morning. I think as a nation, we have not taken the issue of the Takwadi girls serious because if the whole CID boss could come out to make mockery of us as a nation by saying we know where the girls are, but in actual sense, they did not. It raises questions as to whether they are there to protect us or only the political elite. That's James Jordan in Athena. And the issue of the kidnapped Takwadi girls, in my humble opinion, is not, has not been handled well at all. The CID board should just go uh, to send a signal that government is not shielding its own appointees. That's B. Mustafa in Techiman. Um, this one comes in and says, this is a serious issue. The, um, we should wait for the results and take action if there is any mistake. Another one coming through says, I think the police officer who initially said the girls are in safe hands and would be going back to their families should be arrested. I believe that is actually <laughs> the director general of the CID. <laughs> I believe strongly that police, the police officer is having an idea of their whereabouts. Um, this one comes through and says, good morning, please. I think Mr. Danso is trying hard to save the police service. There are certain officers that shouldn't falter when it comes to their job. We should all, then we should all... Mm, I'm not quite sure what that is, but you're saying the police is clueless in this matter and we must accept it. God help us. Um, Mark in Ho says, it would be very risky if the security persons concentrate on this human part found and forget to continue the search. The situation can be created to divert their attention. This suspect escaped from cells. He could have used that period to create this to be uh, so to re reverse the police. Let's be careful. It's a ring and the rest could still be operating. Uh, Marcus says, Hi Abna, I hear that the key suspect says the girls are alive and kicking in Nigeria. So why, why, not, uh, why does the police not go with him to Nigeria and rescue them? Well, I haven't heard that. Has he said that recently? Even after the remains have been found? Well, okay. Good morning to you Abna and your panelists. It's awkward that the Ghana police did not do a simple basic search of the premises of the accused after he was re-arrested. And what has happened to the personnel who aided the alleged kidnapper to escape? The CID boss is also a joke to come out to say, you, you know, well, we know where the girls are. Gosh, God help Ghana. That's George and Sunyani. The messages just keep coming through. And um, this one says, good morning. I've been at the earlier pronouncement by the CID boss to the effect that they knew about the where they knew the whereabouts of the girls only for her to make a U-turn that she was only giving hope to the families. It's in it was distasteful. On that score, she was irresponsible. 
and playing on the key uh, on, the, on the emotions of the affected families. She has not been reprimanded or asked to step aside for gross display of incompetence. So on that note, I just ask the people calling for the CID boss to resign or be sacked. What do you think? Quickly, because we need to uh, you know, wrap up here. Well, before we do, we do that, I think we need to take a, a good assessment of the, the job of the CID boss. Uh, his, his job goes beyond this just a statement she made in as much as uh, we, we we may all agree that that statement wasn't the best and uh, in fact she could have put it in a way that would have saved her all these troubles because mm -hmm. indeed indeed uh, the the leads the information we are getting is that the leads were there to show that the girls were alive at Very the well. time too bad so, but we need to take a break so sure. we will you know come back soon Stick and stay with us. Is a key point, and we are live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7, and online at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we're wrapping up on the conversation here, uh, focused on the developments res in respect of the three Takrade missing girls. And um, I'll be taking some messages here and return to the panelists for their closing remarks. Um, this one is coming in from David in Adenta. He says, I disagree with Prof. How can a professional institution like the police service call a press conference, make a categorical statement like this, and want us to forgive them? Um, Longinus says, Abna, good morning. Our intellectuals have failed us as a country. That is why we are where we are today. Where's the professionalism and preparation? Um, he said, the, the, I'm not quite sure, I can't make head or tail of that. Let me move on. Good morning to all members in TV, at TV3. In fact, it's a big shame to Ghana Police Service. Uh, it's a year now, and they find these kidnapped girls. This is Osma from Okia. So it's yet to be confirmed. They've retrieved some human remains, but it's yet to be confirmed that it is the Takwadi medicine girls. Um, the relatives of the missing kidnapped Takwadi girls appear to be detecting or dictating, sorry, to the security personnel on how to do their jobs. Their frustration is understandable, but they should know that they also have the responsibility of keeping um, eyes on the activities of their children. Okay, why are you behaving as if the police have not rescued any kidnapped persons in Takade, including a toddler? Um, that is Edem in Ho. Um, good morning, Abna. Great panel by all standards. When sensitive issues come up, Leadership is expected to be meticulous and candid in their operations. The utterances of the CID boys was unfortunate, and she must be held responsible if anything um, happens to the family. For me, we need to show leadership when the reality comes and say goodbye. Madame Tiwa Dodankwa is gradually destroying the image of the CID and the Ghana Police Service as a whole. That is Aki in Ifia constituency. So um, I'll pull the bricks on the messages here and return to our panelists. Um, Kennel, if you could give us your closing remarks yeah. on this um, in a minute. My personal view is that the, the investigation at this stage is at a very critical or crucial juncture. The outcomes of the um, DNA analysis will help us to go in one of two directions. Yeah. One, either the girls are eliminated as the bones not being right. those of the girls, and therefore the investigation must continue, uh, as has been the case. Or they are eliminated, oh sorry, they are confirmed as being the bones, in which case there is a bit of closure, at least for these three girls. At that point, <coughs> I've mentioned that there's a leadership issue. At that point, if it is confirmed that the bones belong to the three girls, the leadership of the Ghana Police Service must advise themselves mm. uh, accordingly. If it is not, they need now to redouble, you know, and redeploy some new tools and so on to try and bring closure uh, on this case, especially uh, for, for the families and be better able to manage know how they divulge or yeah. disclose information to the public domain right and they manage i mean their interaction with the families That's as well right. very well oh. well i think I, I want to side with colonel on this issue 
uh, because uh, this uh, case specifically and other cases that are coming up or that have come up in the past and we have not been able to handle them very well would give us the, the new directions as to how institutions uh, can be built and resourced mm. uh, and the way they need to work. If you watch out, we've come to this juncture because of um, lapses. When Wills broke jail, there is the possibility that that was the time they started also doing other things, covering their, uh, their back. And maybe if these bones are the bones of the girls, then maybe that was the period the girls were eliminated. And so I believe that this is a lesson for us. And uh, at any point in time, we must know that we are growing and our institutions must grow. Uh, politicians must allow the institutions to grow. Uh, institutional uh, alertness is very important. Mm. And so Madam Tiwa, the lapses, and any other person, the lapses, will grow with it. Um, the institutional uh, procedures that make a person resign are also there. We may put the pressure, but then we can't just stand this way and say, just resign. So we need to keep that one also. Finally, I strongly suspect that uh, security awareness in the country is on the low side. Mm. And that is why we don't understand the police and we suspect them and they suspect us and things like that. So awareness in security, the media has a role to play, uh, professionals have a role to play and what not. So security awareness, we need to now very begin well. to think about those very areas. We should be security conscious. Oh, yes. then, uh, Doc, Afaka. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, will, I will side with the, the person who sent the last message you read that it is indeed the professionalism of the police and the, the procedures they have, gone, they have taken us through is indeed a shame. Mm. And really, if you look at that, the truth of the matter is that a lot of them have absolutely no profession. The professionalism is absent. And we cannot blame them because they have not received the right training to become professionals. So this is the time we need, instead of bashing the police, we need to begin to think about how we can assist the police to becoming the professional police service we require as a nation. Otherwise, we will keep bashing, bashing, bashing. Nothing so changes. No the training, their training does not change. Nothing changes. It will be the same old story mm. after 20 years, after 30 years. So in this, this particular case, has come at the right time, Unf not at the, unfortunately, as as, unfortunate right. as it is, it has come at the right time for us to see the lapses we have in our police service and correct them mm. as soon as possible. Well, we hope we get to the point where we get a transformed police service to the level that we really, you know, desire it to be at. Um, because some would say that, well, we've had several instances that have, you know, could be described as a turning point, but well, we've moved on and it's been business as usual. So let's just see how things pan out. But really and truly, we hope that we see some transformation within the police here because, I mean, it's an undisputed fact that we have this challenge. Let me say a big thank you to the panelists for this part of the show this morning. Um, we've had Dr. Richmond Afwapa. He is the head of Forensic Science Department at the University of Cape Coast. Next has been Professor Vladimir Intridanzo, Director, Academic Affairs, Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College. And to my right, we've had Kenal Retired, Festo Sobwaji, a security analyst. Thank you, thank you so much, gentlemen, for coming to the show. We'll be back to look at matters regarding the Ghana Manganese Company Limited. Stick and stay with us. We'll be, we'll be back shortly. Welcome back. You're still watching and listening to The Key Points. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So just come by with a conversation about the uh, recent developments concerning the three Takra de Missing Girls. Now, we're turning our attention to matters pertaining to uh, the Ghana Manganese Company Limited, where, you know, this week, earlier on in the week, specifically on Monday, the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Mr. Kweku Asumatreme, um, announced that uh, there had been a government uh, decision to um, call for a shutdown of the company owing to some infractions they cited, among them being, um, you know, failure to pay taxes amounting to 300 million US dollars and some other matters. And uh, subsequently, uh, the minister issued a press, con uh, sorry, a press release yesterday, uh, 9th August 2019, indicating that following two meetings with the interested parties, um, the parties had agreed to expedite actions towards the resolution of the issues raised and so the company uh, could resume operations. Now, 
We're looking at exactly what the situation is about, what are the issues raised, and what is the way forward in terms of the resolution of the problem. We now have with me uh, in the studio to look at this situation, uh, Mr. Solomon Kote. He is the General Secretary of the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, ICU. Next, we have Mr. Seta Bloso, he is a labor consultant. And to my right, we have Mr. Samuel Bekwe, member of the Civil Society Platform for Oil and Gas. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. It's good, good to have you here. Um, I'll start off with, I, th I think I can start with you, Mr. Seta Bloso, here. Um, I'm trying to understand the, the, the events that you know transpired this week. So there was the call to the company, the Ghana Manganese Company Limited, to shut down operations or close, you know, mm. its operations, no minings, no explorations, no exportations, all of that. Because according to the minister, uh, there had been some alleged adverse findings coming from a certain technical and financial audit that had been conducted into the operations of the company. Subsequently, the company, uh, you know, through its chief operations officer, mm categorically denied all the allegations about failure to pay the taxes, royalties, and all of that. Then the minister comes back yesterday in, in a press release and says that following two meetings that had been held, you know, with all interested parties, including the ministry itself, uh, the Ministry for Science, Environment, and Innovation and Technology, and others, some officials from the, minist sorry, the Minerals Commission, the parties had agreed to, you know, expedite action on the resolution of the issues that had been raised. And so the company could resume mm. work. The shutdown was called for based on a certain reason. Now they've been asked to resume work owing to a certain agreement that has become. I'm just trying to understand, is it the case that the allegations that were made by the minister coming from that audit is true, even though the company had denied it categorically? Or what? Because I, I, I'm not I'm not getting it. If they were shut down for a purpose, then it's, it should presuppose that it's either it's, it's turned out that that wasn't the case or what exactly is the situation. So on what basis has the um, resumption of work, you know, been, been, been predicated, if you mm. like? Thank you. I think it's, a, for me, a very unfortunate development. Mm. Uh, the indication I get is that the mi minister certainly must have acted on, on insufficient information. Uh, they make reference to a certain a technical and financial audit. Yes, but they did. The, we are Between not told. Between and twenty seventeen, we are not told who conducted the mm. audit and whether the findings were presented to the company for its... Uh, well, the CEO its said it hadn't been presented to them. Ah, that, that presents mm. a, a very serious s situation. Because also, when the minister announced the shutdown, he was reported to have said they were now going to meet stakeholders and see whether uh, uh, to, to have some people charged, etc., uh, etc. Et and that is most unfortunate. That's why I'm saying that the the Mr. Mas have been misled with whatever he has mm. to have taken that position because the report should have gone to the company for its comments. And in the, in the, on the issues that were being raised, the position of the Ghana Revenue Authority is critical in, in confirming or substantiating any information that the, the, the ministry had. It does appear that this uh, is not the case because in every mine, GRE uh, has both at the tax level uh, has has persons stationed in the mine mm. who deal with production figures, what is going for exports, and then they, on that basis, can determine what tax is due. So is GRE must, must in fact be the first to say, yes, this is it. So it's, it's, it's a bad case. And mm -hmm. I, I think that the, the minister and all his colleagues needs to hasten slowly in 
in giving such orders. Mm -hmm. they, they disturb the corporate governance and, and the industrial atmosphere. Very well. Let me turn to you, Samuel Bekwe, here. So you've heard Mr. Abloso suggesting that perhaps the minister's earlier call uh, for the, uh, um, the company to shut down was a bit perhaps premature, having regard to the fact that he had indicated that they were yet to meet, you know, stakeholders to discuss the issues that had, you know, come up and all. And subsequently, nonetheless, there was this press release that was issued yesterday suggesting that, yes, the company could go back to its operations because there had been an agreement by the parties concerned that, you know, they would expedite action to resolve in the solutions here. And in my earlier question to Mr. Abdul, so I had indicated that, is it the case then that there's been some admissions in there that, well, it's either, yes, what you're saying is true or that is not true, but nonetheless, let's see how best we can forge together. I think for the benefit of listeners, mm -hmm. um, let me take us back a bit. Um, mining industry, it's what normally economists, we will say capital intensive. Um, capital intensive means uh, it uses a lot of capital machinery. Mm -hmm. It requires a lot of money to invest. It is not uh, unusual to see a lot of the mining companies being owned by foreign companies in, in this country because it requires huge investment, even though we have always advocated for Ghanaians to take up some of these uh, investments. But let me now come down to say that when it comes to the production, we have clear laws and we have um, regulations that uh, governs the mining sector, mm -hmm. including Ghana manganese, which is considered as a, you know, let me say, like a mineral, metal and mineral uh, company. Yes, GRA has the responsibility to conduct a tax audit and to some extent other audit, mm -hmm. um, what we call transfer pricing audit. However, the minister under Act 703, which is which was passed in 2006, the Minerals and Minerals, minerals Act, right. uh, has a pow the power in consultation with the Minerals Commission, which is the regulator, to actually act as the minister acted, um, uh, where they find any infractions or suspect uh, any issue that may bring, you know, down the economy or related matters. It could even be fraud you know, financial, mm. uh, more practice and all, and all that. Yes, GRU conducted an audit, which the company accepted. So <coughs> is that the audit the, the minister was referring to? No, I want to build that particular sure. story. Okay. When GRU conducted an audit, we have always been pushing for transfer price and audit because the sector is highly risk. The risk is high mm -hmm. when it comes to what we call illicit financial flows, meaning it requires huge amount of money. It brings in more revenues, which is more amount, I mean, revenues. Last year alone, I think the mining sector may have contributed more than $2.5 billion. Yeah. That's not small money. When you go to oil and gas, just for us, oil and gas gave us almost a billion dollars in terms of revenues. And since we started producing oil, we've received about $5 billion. The same thing with mining. If you go back to calculate, there is a lot of money that they bring. Mm. But we always want to make sure they are paying the right taxes. Mm. The issue that we have, why the minister may have conducted other audits, is that when GRU conducted the audit, they found out that production figures mm -hmm. may have been underquoted. That's why I use may mm -hmm. by the companies. Also, and this may be the country's fault over the years ghana manganese when it was under the ukrainians and even when transferred under to the chinese have been the one giving us the price per metric ton for manganese and at the same time some of the conditions that allows for insider trading or trade mispricing or transfer pricing, pricing yeah. was existing meaning that the company that buys the oil mm. is actually a sister company to ghana manganese so these conditions had necessitated GRE to conduct a transfer pricing audit. Mm. After the transfer pricing audit, GRE had adjusted the price that Ghana Manganese had been given us, and the company paid not less than $14 million in addition as taxes. According to the company, I think it had covered from 2000, and I think it was around six years back. Mm. So yes, but the minister had the right to 
you know, or let me say the responsibility to con contract external firms to conduct further uh, uh, analysis or let me say audit, audit from the company, which they did. Mm. The only unfortunate, as I agree um, with my, my other panelists, is that, yes, when you find these issues, which the company claims or company says that uh, they were not, you know, contacted in terms of after the audit was done, mm. even though they agreed they were aware of this audit because they said they provided some information sure. to these same auditors that the minister brought, but they were not able to have the chance to validate uh, the results or the outcomes of the audit. So I think with that, should the minister move to stop or suspend or shut down a mining company, I would say it wouldn't be an, in the right interest for, the, for, for Ghanaian citizens unless there is a serious financial malpractice or fraud or issues that lead to criminality. Mm. When you shut down, there will be no production for that two days. There will be no, um, there will be no let me say, uh, royalty for you as a country. Because as the company <coughs> released their press release, year to date, let me say from their calendar year to date, they had produced not less than 4 million metric tons of wet uh, oil. Uh, after from wet oil, you have to process to dry oil before okay. you export. But 4 million metric tons, you could be able to calculate the amount of royalties you will get mm. or calculate per month how much, how much they produce per day or month. Mm. Meaning that the two or three days that we have shut them down without producing, we may twice. also lose some money. Mm. So I think it was a bit hastily. And I think, um, for me, I want to get it clear because I don't have that information. Maybe the minister had shared the report with the company and before making that decision. Because the, if not, then it would have been a bit hastily. Mm. Why did he shut down the company uh, before having a meeting with them? Whilst you could have still allowed them to produce. Mm. Uh, I think that is the issue that I, I, I would mm. want us to... Very well, indeed, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, 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 my producer tells me that the, min, uh, the minister, Mr. Kukwas Machame, I mean, agreed to talk to us. So we are trying to yeah. reach him on the line and That's then right. get, get, get him to, you know, speak to the issues. It will be mm. important to hear from him specifically on that. But still on the, the, the action of the minister, you know, I'm reading from the government of Ghana website here, which has, you know, posted the story here. And it says that uh, the decision, you know, to shut down the Ghana Manganese Company Limited was announced by the minister. And the decision was taken after several infractions were found upon the completion of a preliminary technical and financial audit. I'm thinking the word preliminary there mm. is, I mean, jumps at me because then it means it's not necessarily Complete. conclusive. Mm. So to have acted on that is in itself problematic as well. Um, yes, to some extent. But sometimes this has not just happened in Ghana. In Tanzania, when President Magufulu uh, took position, there was an acacia mines. Maybe I would maybe for the benefit of listeners, let me look at some of the areas where companies take to engage in some of these mm -hmm. infractions. Not all of them are illegal. Most of them, they will go within the legal <coughs> uh, boundaries of the country mm -hmm. to conduct that. So when we so talk then it about wouldn't be described as infractions. Once it's described as an infraction, then well, now we have legal corruption. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we have something we call legal corruption. Mm -hmm. So corruption in some countries mm -hmm. may have been criminalized. Mm -hmm. But uh, within the legal confines, if you take them to court, you may never get them uh, mm. to be, uh, you know, at fault of the law. Let me give some examples. For instance, if a company is trading with its sister company, it can decide to let the sister company undercoat the price of whatever they are trading. Mm -hmm so that their total revenues become less. And by the time they deduct their cost, and by the way, royalty that they even pay to us is cost deductible in the mining sector. Mm. And by the time they deduct their cost, we will get a very small amount of mm -hmm. profit mm. where we put our, all our hopes as Ghanaians on because on we have about 35% yes. Yes, corporate tax. The other point is, when they are shipping these um, ore, mostly in developing countries, we let them ship them in, in the raw form. Um, in terms of the quotation, so they may say we are shipping this amount or uh, metric tons of manganese. Later, a lot of studies have proven that the countries receiving would have quoted a different amount or different quantity of that or they had received. Of course, we had an example where the vice president had confirmed, we knew already, 
that uh, Switzerland had said they'd receive more of our gold and it was estimated at, uh, at mm. about 2 billion. Whilst we, in our own data, were saying we shipped only about 1.5 billion to Switzerland. So these are some of the cases where companies take on. There are other cases where companies will buy machines. Mm. Sometimes they have shares in the manufacturer of the machines. And then the machines is estimated at a higher cost. Right. The manufacturer has given you the details that because Ghana, you know, rocks are, are, are unique, we need to make the machine uh, mm. in a different way so that it can actually be efficient. Mm. And so the cost in the market was maybe 100 million, but for this specific use, we, it, we charge the company 150 million. You go inside, you notice that the company actually owns shares in that manufacturing. The more the cost goes up, of course, they're able to transfer uh, and siphon some money out of this country. So these loopholes are there. And it is not only Ghana. Many countries, even in Australia, struggle to deal with these companies okay. as well. So these loopholes are there. But in, with the Ghana manganese case, uh, the two loopholes that have been uh, widely discussed is production figures right. and price. And the fact that they are selling the manganese to their sister company. Mm. So these have been the issue. And as I said, they give us the price as GRA. We use the price to calculate their mm -hmm. revenue and taxes. Over the years, what have been our reference price? Because when you look at in, in, in the manganese global market, for instance, if you look at the manganese coming from Peru, mm. sometimes it can be estimated, of course, that is CIF, in, including the freight and right. insurance and everything. It can be estimated at $240 per, per ton. In 2016, Ghana manganese produced about I think about 2 million. If you do the estimation, you divide the 2 million by the value we got under in the EITR report, they actually estimated it about $40 per ton. Mm. So if you compare this to the global market, you could see that our, our manganese, which also have a higher concentrate of yeah. manganese itself. So we have about 60% mm. grade, which is sought after. Let me say it's yes, sought after. The demand is higher right. for Ghana manganese. So you could see that the price difference between what other countries may have gotten or other traders may have sold mm. and then between how to, what well, we have gotten, I think the price is huge. Yeah. And that is where the new audit that the minister had done that. In assuming, I'm assuming that the audit would have said, assuming we had sold at this price, it's which is what is get. prevailing mm. in the market. Yeah. This is how much we could have mm. gotten from this. But over the years, they have been giving us the price until GRA did the audit to identify that now GRA is the one who gives the company the price. Right. And I'm asking myself, as a country, how have we, you know, uh, not paid attention to this over the years? Yeah. And we have been price takers from the companies. Mm. Right. And I think this is where the challenge is. So the loopholes are there, but for Ghana Manganese, it is on production and the price and mm -hmm. the fact that they are selling to their sister company. Right, and those are the questions that have been raised. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll quickly turn to um, Mr. Kote here for the, you know, the aspect that border on labor specifically and the potential. Of course, they've been asked to resume operations. So uh, the fears of any, you know, uh, you know labor agitation for now is, is, is not real. But it seems there could be a potential. I mean, looking at how things pan out within the next, you know, few days or so. How is Labour <coughs> positioned in respect of this? Thank you. I will may want to make a quick comment on mm. the Minister's attitude. I will hasten to say that the Minister maybe have acted uh, maybe too quick than he should have acted. I want to join my two panelists who have said that it depends on the kind of information that was available to him probably that which if he had not done that we we're going to lose more or some more negative issues will have impacted on the economy and the kind of work we do we are hoping now that he's volunteered to call in he may spill the bean and let us know why he did that because for workers um to hear a siren and say look uh, workers come to a standstill everybody should go through process shut down machines and mm -hmm. then go home without a recourse Obviously, you have spark agitations right. and questions to be raised. What is it that we have done wrong? Now that it is not the workers who have acted uh, in tandem with the law, but rather it is government who has come to demand that the place should be shut down. Obviously, there will be one or two outcries to say, what is it? If it comes at that, workers get to know. Money is not paying the proper you know, tax, mm -hmm. okay, and uh, these under dealings you are going to mess up with future negotiations with the organization because 
workers now come to table and they know clearly that ah, with all these 12 of hours, okay, some siphoning, some you know, under dealing are actually going up, and uh, when such remote you know issues are carried to negotiations table, it will actually mess up everything. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, for these two days that we have in work, that we are going to go back. Uh, is it going to be deducted from our salaries mm -hmm. or what really is going to happen? Mm -hmm. Who bear that cost that has arisen out of this decision? Right. If the decision was a prudent one, okay, then obviously management will have to bear that because we will not lose it. <coughs> but the fact also that we were made not to come to the premises, okay, mm -hmm. then again we cannot also charge that against the employer because the laws are clear. If I come to the premises and I'm not giving job to do, but this one there is job to be done, and the employer says, don't come. So we will describe that as a lockout. Mm. Okay? A lockout purely out of the irresponsibility in quotes. Because now the employer had come out to also debunk everything that the minister had said. Exactly. So we really don't know whether the minister even issued an ultimatum that if you don't correct ABC, I'll be compelled to go under my 703 and then act in the way that I'm so, coming to act. Mm -hmm. So whether that was done or it was just an abrupt situation, he appeared on the scene and say, look, like we see people who go around demolishing properties mm -hmm. that are waterways, okay? No All the time, the owners of the property will say, oh, we're not giving enough notice or not giving notice at all. So in this case, the mm -hmm. manganese authorities, were they giving appropriate notice? Because I want to respect the minister in his position, knowing how this can be a huge backslash on government mm -hmm. if he has acted, you know, on impulse, if he has acted in a manner that cannot be supported mm -hmm. by law or any other arguments that he has. So if these things had gone in this way, Labour will just take a sigh of relief and realize that it will be nice to come back to work. But trust me, in the coming few weeks, workers will want to know exactly what has brought the company to this uh, it's, it's, it's a poor reflection on the reputation of the, of, of the institution. Yes, and wherever we work as workers, it is not only the remuneration we get. We want to have some image of the institution right. that add value to us. Right. So if you are working for an employer who is um, uh, avoiding tax, who is more That's or less, you know, yeah. yes, stringy. Mm -hmm. It's all about money. From what we have heard, okay, the, the element of audit has come in, then it means that appropriate taxes have not been paid. If that is so, Trust me, workers would seriously want to find out. Even the presence of the GAR personality who is over there, mm -hmm. who are the external exactly. I mean, who are we, the, we would need to interrogate that. Who are the yeah. external auditors of uh, uh, Ghana Manganese? Okay. okay, and then even their own internal audit. Okay, does it mean that all this while is window dressing that has been done over mm -hmm. the period? Okay, so what has also informed the minister now with what stretch of um, uh, very relevant information that he has that has made him to act the way he has right. acted? Mm -hmm. So I can foresee that. Uh, Labour will also now begin to say, can we have a second look at our accounts? Because under Section 98 of the Act, Labour has a right to demand all information that will make their negotiation right. So for what has happened, Labour will now going to go deep more and make more demands when it's coming to the table. Because mm -hmm. volumes that are being mentioned and quantums of money that are being mentioned, okay, who wish that we deserve what we've actually labored for? Right. And if in this case, some few people are run away with it. This is what we have. Exactly. You want to have that, you know, yeah. set out clearly. Indeed, the workforce uh, at, at um, Ghana Manganese um, Company Company. Limited is about 1,500 or so, A according to the statement issued by the um, uh, COO. Um, do we have the minister online? Um, very well. So we have the minister for lands and natural resources online. That's uh, Mr. Kweku Asumachreme. Good morning, uh, Honorable Good morning. And th thank you so much for joining us on the show. So, You're welcome. great. This week we had, initially there was the announcement of a shutdown. And then uh, just yesterday we saw your press release, which, uh, you know, suggested that there had been some, you know, about, about two meetings with the interested parties. And so you had come to a certain decision that you would, you know, um, have the company resume operations and there had been some agreements as to how you were going to resolve the issues that had been raised. Um, could you confirm whether or not, and I'm asking this against the background of the fact that the company acting through its chief operations officer categorically came out in a statement to deny all the alleged findings that you had you know, um, cited as coming from the technical and financial audit. Is it the case that the company 
um, despite the allegation, uh, despite the, 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 the denials, has now come to a certain, you know, admission about the wrongdoing alleged against them. And for that matter, you are looking at how we can deal with the situation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, you and the listeners. <coughs> I think that uh, the company was shut down, not in perpetuity. It was shut down in a jiffy as the, the Act 703 that governs their operation and all other mining operations. And the uh, agreement, lease agreement that we entered into with us, that is Government of Ghana and the Ghana Manganese Company Limited. So uh, the findings from the auditor done by ISCH has been made known to them and they came up not with figures but with words as per their press conference mm -hmm. and all that they stated on various platforms. We have come with financial and technical auditing and we have spoken to this effect that it takes uh, us back to 2010 to present time. And we've been able to come up with some figures indicating that these are their um, indebtedness to the government of Ghana. They are disputing. Mm -hmm. We met yesterday, and our intention is not to collapse the business. Mm -hmm. Our intention is not to take the business from them, where uh, uh, people are thinking that some senior members of our party, of our government, are interested in the business and they want to take it. Far from that. We were looking at it from the infractions that we allege that they might have committed against the people of Ghana, against the state. That is why all this uh, uh, auditing uh, was, was done and we have come up with these figures against them. They are but, but, but so, so we, when we met yesterday, okay. we agreed on eight member committee, which had been set up to review both the press conferences made by us, and then the attempts of reference it will include those uh, uh, press conferences, and then the, 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 the findings as raised in the auditor. So these people are going to, this committee is going to sit down within 10 days, and they will report to us from there, we we'll take a decision. Uh, what happened yesterday, again, was to the effect that the only way bridge that seemed to suggest figures that, uh, by way of funding... Honorable, sorry, before we go on to the way bridge, if we could still um, exhaust the bit about the audit. Now, you are saying that there's been a committee set up to look at, as it were, the cases of both sides to determine what exactly the situation is. Is that correct? What I'm saying is that because of the denial yes. and because of our insistence that these are the figures that have come out from the ISH mm -hmm. uh, auditor and they are denying. So there is a committee to review all that. That committee has been set up. It's right. not to the effect that what they say is what we are admitting. Right. No. And that the issues they raise in their press conference just opposing same with ours all will have to form part of the terms of reference. Very well, I get that. Committee. I get that, but what I'm trying to establish is the fact, I mean, what people have suggested that perhaps after the um, report, the audit was, you know, submitted to you, perhaps the company should have been given an opportunity to look at it before the shutdown was ordered, because it looks that, like that we are going back to a situation that is, where that, that should have happened. That is not happened. the issue, please. If you know the history of this auditor, this issue wouldn't come in. We have long shut down the company way mm -hmm. back in January. And then there was that plea that we allowed them for them to go to work whilst the auditing goes on. The two sides agreed. So it is not far from right for today to have shut down. It is not a question of shutdown again, albeit they are going back to work. 
And what is happening now is that there is a committee that is going to go into the matter, the issues we have raised, the, the findings as it came from the uh, auditor's report, mm -hmm. and what they also raised in their press statement. Mm. See? Uh -huh. So that is the matter. It is not about uh, seven or not seven. Albeit, they have the, the auditor's report now. We don't need to belabor the point. Uh, the next 10 days, I uh, believe they would have completed their job and would have come back to you to tell you that this is the position, that is the position. We have taken into consideration that we are human. About 3,000, sorry, about 2,000 uh, people depend on this business. Mm -hmm. 1,500 are direct workers, 500 are indirect. We mm -hmm. cannot, by closure of the company, cause them to go staffing. So we need to. We need to give it a human face. That is exactly what we have done. The awaiting bridge we have taken over, the government has taken over, so that the accuracy of the figures as they presented. Now, the, the way, the way Bridge, you talk about, in your press release, now, now you're saying that the government has taken over, but in your press release, you said there's going to be a joint manning. So what is it exactly? Is it that it's still the joint manning or government has taken over to the you know, exclusion government of... has taken over. Okay. But they will be part of it. And we are bringing national security. We are bringing the Minerals Commission and all that. The Wayne Bridge is for them. That particular bridge is theirs. And we have taken over. We suggested to them mm. and took over. And then brought them on board. Brought the Minerals Commission on board. And we are bringing national security on board. So that accuracy of the figures as always presented will be obtained. At the port, our uh, people will be there. They will also be there so that we get the correct figures. But my understanding, Honorable, my understanding from, you know, the panelists here is that this joint, you know, um, manning is something that is done. The GRA is, is, is present or is at post on these uh, manning bridges, sorry, on these way bridges alongside the officers of the company. So uh, the impression I'm getting is that nothing really new is happening in respect of this. <laughs> Something new is happening. Something new, if it granted what you have just said is right, that it was the GRA that was manning it. GRA, as it goes there, that, 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 uh, or does that include national security? Does that include the ministry? Does so, that include hmm. Minerals Commission? <laughs> so are we raising issues with the GRA's performance over no, the years no, then? please, don't put me at where something that I have not said. Please, may you listen. I'm saying that if GRA was with them, you are telling me that the panelists are saying that GRA was with them all the time and nothing new has happened. And I'm offering this explanation that something new has happened because previously the ministry was not part of, mm. the Minerals Commission was not part of, the national security was not part of. Granted that the GRA was there. If the GRA was there, it was between GRA and GNC. And not GRA at one end, the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources at another end, and then the, the Minerals Commission, which is an agency of the, uh, the, the Lands and Natural Resources Ministry, also being part of. And then the security agency bringing on board the national security. So that is it. Very well. I, 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 one of my panelists has a question for you. I, please, Honorable, one, um, one of my panelists has a question for you, Mr. Subon Kote. He's the, um, the okay. General Secretary of the ICU. Yes, Mr. Kote, carry on. Honorable, thank you very much and uh, offering us this time for more expatiations on the matter. For us in Labour, we wanted to know whether or not um, over the period you have questioned them and they didn't respond, that led to the abrupt closure of the work because that is going to create a lot of labor agitation now. Uh, may we know whether you were not getting the attention you needed and that led to the adult closure of the place. Oh, that, that issue partly is subtle because there is not going to be labor agitation. Uh, we, as, as I said earlier, that we have given it a human face. We have considered the number of employees in that particular setup and for that matter, we cannot sit for such people to go hungry. If you look at it carefully, if each of them 
is married and has one wife, that adds to another 4,000. And if each has a child, that adds up to 6,000. So we cannot sit. This government is a government that is quite humane, and that it is a government that believes in rule of law. And for that matter, we will not go on that tangent where we will cause uh, uh, this labor agitation to happen. I know, but very well. But uh, the first question he asked was whether or not there had been an opportunity given to the um, company for them to, you know, rectify any wrongs that were ongoing. Oh, for which reason you moved in given. to close down? It's been, it's been given. Notice had amply been given to them. So now we have crossed over that particular okay. level. Very and well. Level we, we, will we are very is, well. Uh, where the committee is to work and then bring its findings. That's why we didn't sit as sole committee. We made them to bring people, their officers on board, and we have equally so. So uh, submitted our list to them, so they know themselves, and they they, they began sitting from yesterday because we started okay. counting the ten days from yesterday. Very well, thank you so much, um, Honourable. This is where we'll end it. In uh, Mr. Kweku Asumachema, he's the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, there mm -hmm. giving us some insights <coughs> into the situation regarding the Ghana um, Manganese Company Limited. We'll take a break. When we come back, we return to the panelists. Stick and stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back. So uh, we're just in the final lap of the show and we're looking at the developments at the Ghana Manganese Company Limited. We Just before the break, we spoke to the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Mr. Kweku Asumachu. He made a, a number of comments in there. Particularly, I was taking... Uh, I was struck by, you know, what he had to say regarding um, the manning of the way bridge to ensure that, you know, the actual um, volumes are, are, are noted so that we get, you know, value for exactly what is being, you know, shipped and all of that. I will turn to Mr. Seth Abloso here. Let me hear from you on, yes. on, on, on the minister's comments. Yeah. He talked about, you know, in terms of the joint manning. I mean, earlier on, we, we, we it, I mean, you, you indicated that that is already happening mm. so to suggest that there's now this new arrangement then he goes on to say that well yes the GRA may have been there but now they are adding national security which is still government yeah. so and then I try to get him to you know address the issue but is it a question about the performance of the GRA person or people at you know posted there which went into something else but essentially the point is government representation is already there. Yes. So it's not as if it's a new thing. Mm. But even with that arrangement, we seem to have issues. So clearly production figures and all the other figures are problematic. I mean, b b behind the scenes, we we're talking about per perhaps resource to technology to put away this whole human interface that yeah. will create issues. Nice. Let me hear from you on that, as well as you know the, 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 the reactions from the uh, minister. Resource to technology is important, mm -hmm. but it's also important that the personnel we have from the Ghana Revenue Authority don't stay too long at, at post. That they are, they are sufficiently trained to understand the, the environment in which they are going to operate. Mm. And then moved or transferred at very short notice where the they don't anticipate that this will, will, this will be done. Now, uh, the minister mentioned also that the action was, uh, people were saying that the company was going to be taken over and party people were going to. But the, the action created a lot of fear and panic. Fear and panic also because the minister mentioned among the options available to government, which included the takeover of the company and that has serious implications for the investment climate etc now he says now he, he did something that's fine mentioned the number of workers who are directly mm -hmm. affected and then the linkage to families but there are others as well others as well who for whom the company's operation brings a lot of money to their home economy persons who go petty trading selling gary selling groundnuts 
when workers are at post, there are a lot of people who trade and send some money home. So it's larger than just the workers and their families. But then there's, there's also the issue of compliance and yes. for such, yes, we do need the, um, the, the foreign direct investment and all of that, mm. but they ought to also comply with the laws. Yes, but, but that, is, that is our problem. We must ensure that uh, every company wants to maximize productivity, maximize profits, and some are, I regret to say, unscrupulous. Okay. Their, their profit motivation uh, knows no bars. So we need to be vigilant and deal with some of these situations. Uh, in their champion era, there was a Joe Appear Committee of Inquiry into RT Briscoe. And the things they found, machinery that imported the, the what is it, RT Briscoe in Ghana, the evidence came where the companies had, had told overseas how to price what is coming to Ghana, and then we pay in foreign exchange. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, it's a very rough yeah. environment, yeah. And, and we need to, we need to be, be, be serious about what we do. Sure, yeah. very well. Uh, okay. Mr. Bikwe, you I know you had to, you wanted to touch on the signal sent to the investor community and other things, so quickly let's do that. Yes, um, may I speak about two or three stuff? Um, let me say, if company you may not, Yes. One minute, 30 seconds. Companies <laughs> may not have breached any law yet. Mm -hmm. The issues from the audit is that price and production. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We allow them to actually give us their own price and mm -hmm. production mm -hmm. figures. But that's... So, that's so, so it's not any law breach. Right. We allow them. If we were very diligent enough, or if we were very serious enough to have made sure we monitor and man every step of the production process, which we have the power. Mm -hmm. Minerals Commission have, is the regulator. GRA could also be there. So I think that the other point is the minister's action, and I understand now that he said he gave them ample time. Right. And then they didn't they really failed to comply, they failed to com uh, yeah. you know, respond to his issue. I think it presents two... There are two sides of uh, the, the minister's action. One is that uh, the signals it may send to other investors or even other pro mines in the country uh, may not be a positive signal. Mm -hmm. However, I think the minister may have also acted to show level of enforcement that yeah. we can actually enforce our laws exactly. right. and yes. the power and the discretion mm -hmm. that the minister has. So uh, I will not be able to judge conclusively on, on, on that, but I think it, it has two sides yeah. of it. And also, um, when we say the only way bridge, what do we mean? <laughs> Couldn't we, as a country, in order to check the production, put our own way bridge next to this? So the car or whatever transport mechanism move from their way bridge straight to ours. So they check this, this and then we mm. check ours. Mm. And then we compare note and say, this is what ours give, this mm. is what yours give. Let's mm. compare. Mm. So I don't, I don't see the seriousness here. And then I would also say that the minister saying that uh, now we have national security, we have this, this underscores the weaknesses in lack of coordination between government agencies. Right. Yeah. Because right. GRA is already there. Yeah. And now we are going to do this. I agree with you. Maybe we should actually bring technology. Eh. And, you know, because at the port, Tema port, we have national security and all that. But there are still infractions yeah. where yeah. the vice president came out and said that we have to reduce our base. Yeah. Because we didn't see any changes, even yeah. when we put all these people there. Very so let's say that maybe we should adopt uh, a technology, technology to reduce exactly all these that uh, human uh, elements. Uh, allegations and issues that we have. Very well. Uh, we, 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 I mean, we're fast running out of time. But Mr. <coughs> Kote, I will want you to, I mean, in the tail end of the show, address the PBC issue. We heard this week that the PBC workers uh, demonstrated um, at the, on the premises of their company and they were citing, quote unquote, incompetence of management. What is the situation exactly happening there? Well, ever since PBC was hired, unfortunately, we don't have much time, so yes, okay. you'll be was hired about it. Cocoa board. It became the strategic local cocoa buying uh, company mm. that made sure that every hamlet and cottage where cocoa is grown, they had interface with the farmer and making sure that cocoa farmer that produce just half bag or quarter bag are all brought together to give us uh, hundreds of thousands of tons that we export every year. Right. Now, uh, PBC strategic placement within the LBCs. It's, it's, it's so important that our mantra, Ghana is Cocoa and Cocoa is Ghana, PBC plays a major role. Now, for some time now, the place have actually been run down. So until the new management was brought in place,
they had a huge legacy debt. Okay. When you from for some time, what, what period are you looking at specifically? I'm looking at the last four years, mm. okay, before this new government came and okay. put people there. So the new management realized that they are handicapped. They didn't have the real liquidity to actually roll out what they are been placed there to do. Mm -hmm. Now, as for workers, they realize that, look, we come to work, no work for us, and we go home. Come to work, no work, go home. No serious worker will be happy to say to himself that I've reported to work. I'm not giving any assignment or the kind of work for me to do. The materials are not there for me to do. So they started agitating and then they put up their issues. This led to the National Union meeting with the board, the board chairman and some reps. We brought all the workers from all the 126 districts. We held meetings and assessed the situation of the business. Now look, this is a boat that is sinking. Everybody must help build the water out of it. Because of that, three years now, no salary increase. Three years now, workers voluntarily said, look, our um, fuel allowance and maintenance allowance, take it off so that we can manage our budget. All these are happening. Mm. Then when we realized that no help was coming and government is having 70% of the sure. entire shares of PBC, so we did a petition and I can say gracefully, that the president showed us such a human compassion and said looking at the viability of the business number one and looking at the role it is playing in the cocoa value chain pbc cannot be allowed to go in the pain mm. and therefore he is going to bend backwards deep and ensure that new life is brought to pbc not only new life it was then that the national union also said was this after the demonstration this no week? it was before okay so that, so that was the news that was broken mm. to you know the workers that came there and our view was that uh, as you advise the cat, you advise the stinking fish. If workers can say <laughs> it is management, then I is also saying that you workers, you to check your own. Uh, yeah. Because the whistleblowing act is there for everybody. Right. And if we look on and uh, the kind of uh, challenges that they have over there, uh, they should be able to say, look, we will expose, we will uh, name, we will shame, and those people must be punished right. if there's any. At the moment, those allegations they put out there have not been tested, so okay. we cannot make currency out of it. Very well. Uh, too bad, but our time is up. We need to go. But let me take some few comments on this issue. Um, John Vanderpoy says, this recent financial irregularity is about GMC, that's a Ghana manganese company, paints a gloomy picture of the company, and I hope the dust settles quickly to protect its integrity. Uh, all this GMC issue should be placed at the doorstep of government. What stops the minister from following due process exam example, writing an official to the company to get their response to the audit report? or sort the view or seek the view of Ghana Revenue Authority on the report. Well the minister tells us that they did and they didn't act within the time. So the minister this one it says Abna, is the minister saying that they didn't know about the number of workers and their dependents in the company? Is he saying they are going to ignore wrongs because of what he called human face? What of the many contracts stopped? Was there no human face to or those people didn't have dependents? The minister should take <laughs> us seriously unfortunately uh this is all the time we have for the show this morning it's been interesting as usual and i would say a big thank you to my panelist mr solomon kote he is the general secretary of the industrial and commercial workers union icu uh, mr seta bloso a labor consultant and mr samuel bequay member civil society platform for oil and gas and thanks to you our viewers and listeners for making a date with us as usual we'll be back here same time next week until then have a good weekend and a productive week. Bye-bye.